Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program will begin in one minute. Well, I think we're uh, we're about all set. Uh, it's like old home week for me. We did this last year. How many here last year? How many did what I did? I didn't. You turned on my cell phone for a whole year to save battery. <laughs> that's how that's how convinced I was. Uh, and you know what happened on that? I didn't get a call from Ray Mason, which was a good idea. I got some words here they, they got. I just want to mention a couple things. I do some work with the, Bar the Board of Army Science and Technology, and we've had the privilege working with Ray to review his operational uh, energy plan. And one thing, uh, he, had a, he has a comment in there that uh, I think is very appropriate. It says, meter everything. Isn't that it, Ray? I, th I think the author's out. Meter everything. And it made me think back. When I was on active duty, we were in a similar period of time uh, going through downsizing. And I used to have a chart I briefed. I said, I have a case of the Rees, because we were reshaping, reducing, reengineering, reinvesting. I didn't do anything without a re in front of it. And another thing we used to so we're examining everything. And you know, they, you've heard the statement, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Or then that change, if it ain't broke, break it. So I would tell you, for energy, if it ain't metered, it ain't. And I think he's got a good point. As much as you can collect the data on the usage of this information. When I initially retired, I worked for uh, Rubbermaid Incorporated. And it was in uh, uh, Worcester, Ohio. And I was a senior vice president for procurement and logistics. And we used to buy energy for 25 plants. And I got into that. And we, and it was amazing with we, how we could influence just by getting into competition to reduce the cost of energy, showing that somebody else was interested in it. So there's a lot of stuff that can be done, and it's very, very important because there's a lot of money spent in this area. Uh, the, I know the public affairs people would uh, appreciate any feedback you have. You have a great panel. And they'll uh, be appropriately introduced. Once again, thanks for coming. Soldier power, basing power, and vehicle power. We are enhancing mission effectiveness through Army power and energy advancements. We are changing Army culture, making energy a consideration in all that we do. Soldier power is the energy needed by a dismounted soldier to operate soldier-worn equipment in field operations. We are lightening the dismounted soldier's energy load and aggressively deploying advanced soldier power solutions such as the Soldier Worn Integrated Power Equipment System or SWIPES, conformal batteries, squad power managers, modular universal battery chargers, solar blankets, portable generators and others. Last year we, uh, we received notification we were deploying in support of uh, Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force Afghanistan to Afghanistan. It was just natural for us to request those additional capabilities that soldier power provided. We're able to take something that would be just wasted and useless to us, harvest it, put it into another battery, and use it for our operational needs. So it was a win-win uh, situation for everybody, our support uh, and sustainment soldiers 
and our operators on the ground. Three to six pounds of batteries to replace 12 to 15 pounds of batteries for a long period of time. Carry like more bullets, more water, more food, less batteries. Definitely carry more ammo um, and or different mission essential equipment dependent upon mission and where you're at. Operational energy is a key enabler essential for combined arms maneuver and soldier sustainment. It's the energy and associated systems, information and processes required to train, move and sustain forces and systems for military operations. I look at two things you got to have to conduct your combat operations to close with and destroy the enemy and that's ammunition and fuel. A lot of the things you need to, but if you don't got those two, you know, you ain't going to make it. Basing power. It includes installations and contingency base camps. We are striving for energy security on our installations, which are dependent on power grids, vulnerable to weather, nature, and acts of terrorism. At forward operating bases and base camps, improving energy security and efficiency represents one of our best opportunities to increase mission capability by decreasing energy usage and our logistical tail. The cornerstone of energy security and sustainability is our net zero strategy. Based on the principles of integrated design, we will appropriately manage our natural resources by producing as much energy as we use, capturing or reusing water equal to the amount we use, and eliminating or reusing solid waste disposal. Building a one megawatt photovoltaic solar field. It's there roughly 1,200 feet long, comprised of about 2,400 solar panels. It's going to roughly put out one megawatt of power. This is going to wind up a very large carport, and it's going to serve a dual purpose of providing the power and providing shelter for the trucks as well. This is the first of two in this location, and the first of four altogether. This is uh, one of a kind, and it's a fascinating project to be on. It's almost, uh, almost a pioneering, pioneering effort. After a complete upgrade to the irrigation system and conversion to a desert scape course in 2005, water savings average up to 56 million gallons per year. In 2001, the East Range Recharge Facility was constructed and recharges close to 130 million gallons per year of treated effluent from the fort's wastewater treatment facility. Every day, over 80 tons of trash ends up in our Fort Hood landfill. Fort Hood has a goal to eliminate all waste across the installation by the year 2020. Every motor pool on Fort Hood is required to have the blue recycled containers. It's up to us to take advantage of these convenient resources. Through energy initiatives, we are leveraging existing authorities to obtain private sector expertise and third-party financing. The Army Energy Initiatives Task Force assists installations in employing large-scale, cost-effective renewable energy projects, including solar, wind, biomass, waste to energy, and geothermal energy sources. Well, this is important to the Army because the Army's energy is at risk, whether it's the energy on our installations or the energy in our operational environments. The Army must diversify its supply of energy. We have to secure that energy on our installations, and we have to get that energy at a price that we can afford over, uh, over the long term. Vehicle power includes air, ground, tactical, and non-tactical vehicles. We are reducing petroleum usage by right-sizing our non-tactical fleet, integrating electric hybrid technologies, and exploring new and emerging alternative fuels. We are developing fuel-efficient combat vehicles, fuel management systems, alternative fuels, and exploring new materials, thus reducing our logistical footprint. The improved drop-in energy-efficient turbine engine program will reduce the fuel consumption of more than 2,000 Black Hawk and Apache aircraft by 25 percent, while at the same time increasing their horsepower and doubling their payload capacity. Through teamwork, relationships, and leader support, we will fulfill the objectives of the Army Campaign Plan. We will provide soldiers agility, flexibility, and resiliency in austere environments, void of wall outlets or generators. We will facilitate transformation, providing facilities, programs, and services to support the Army, our soldiers, and their families. We will reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. We are making energy a consideration in all that we do. We're changing our culture so that every soldier, civilian, and family member in the Army is a power manager.
Good morning, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Richard Kidd. I'm the Army's Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy and Sustainability and the Army's Senior Energy Official. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here to today's panel and to introduce my boss, Assistant Secretary of the Army, Ms. Catherine Hammock. Ms. Hammock is the Assistant Secretary for Installations, Energy, and the Environment. In this role, she provides strategic direction for Army installations and facilities and all matters relating to infrastructure, energy, and environment to support the Army's global mission in a cost-effective, safe, and sustainable manner. She leads a, a great team of experts. I'm privileged to be part of that team. Many of the things that she has initiated and led include establishment of the Army's net zero uh, installation energy and sustainability programs. We plan to uh, achieve net zero status on Army installations uh, by 2020, the creation of the Energy Initiatives Task Force to pioneer the, uh, and accelerate the deployment of large-scale renewables, incorporation of energy security uh, and uh, sustainability objectives as a major ca as a campaign objective inside the Army campaign plan, and inclusion of and designation of DG4 as the our staff proponent for operational energy. Uh, and that is reflected in the new General Order 1. So we are grateful to have all of you here today, and it's my pleasure to introduce my boss, Ms. Hammock. Thank you, Richard, for that introduction, and thank you all for joining us here today. I especially want to thank Sharon Burke, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Operational Energy from OSD for joining us here today. also want to thank some congressional members and their staffs for joining us and helping to uh, uh, better understand the Army's energy message. So the theme of this forum is enhancing mission effectiveness through power and energy advancements. And for the Army, energy is big business. In fiscal year 2011, we spent about $5 billion on energy, both operational energy and installation energy. And we know that our mission effectiveness can be hampered by resource logistics. And over-reliance on fossil fuels and vulnerable electric power grids can jeopardize soldiers' lives and the continued viability of our installations. So therefore, the success of Army missions and the security of our soldiers is dependent on reliable access to energy and to water. We're living in interesting times. Today, the Department of Defense faces multiple threats and non-traditional challenges, all of which threaten our future security environment. We have increasing worldwide demand for scarce resources. And oil prices, oil price increases, are spurred by spreading political unrest, unstable weather, and climate changes. Combined with profound cultural and demographic changes and tensions in several regions, these trends spark and worsen our future security environment. The Army's ability to accomplish our mission on a global scale depends upon secure, uninterrupted access to power and energy. So in today's complex operating environment and volatile energy market, the long-standing assumption that the Army would have unlimited availability of abundant, affordable, and accessible fossil fuels is no longer valid. To maintain a ready and resilient force will require that we have maintained ready and resilient capabilities on our installations and in our operations. Because without energy, as the Vice Chief of Staff, General Corelli, said a couple of years ago, the Army stands still and silent. So energy can either be an enabler or a vulnerability. Sufficient energy enables operational activities of our forces and multiplies their ability to move, shoot, communicate, and protect themselves. 
Right now, over 70% of our convoy requirements are for fuel and water in theater. One in every 46 convoys suffers a casualty. Additionally, our soldiers carry high-tech equipment that consumes energy. And right now, that energy comes from batteries. Historically, the comment has been made that you can find a patrol unit by their trail of batteries left behind as they carry replacement batteries for non-rechargeable situations. In July of this year, attention was drawn to India, where power supplies covering half of their $1.2 billion population were disrupted for hours in some locations and days in other locations. And this is an example of how that country's underinvested and badly maintained infrastructure was creaking its way to near collapse. The national grid failed after it was overloaded. Comparisons can be made to the overall grid system in America, which is in need of significant investment. Year over year on Army installations, we've seen a fourfold increase in the number of power outages. That jeopardizes our ability to maintain a ready and resilient force. So the Army is aggressively pursuing power and energy advancements in an effort to enhance the Army's mission effectiveness and maintain operational readiness at all times, regardless of challenges such as power outages. Smart investments in renewable energy and energy efficient technologies will ensure that the Army of tomorrow has uninterrupted access to energy, water, land, and natural resources. The Army's goals for renewable energy were defined this April when we worked with the White House to make one of the largest commitments to energy and sustainability in this nation's history. We committed to deploy one gigawatt, a thousand megawatts of renewable energy by 2025. That is solar, geothermal, wind, or biomass on Army installations. One gigawatt of renewable energy is enough power to power 250,000 homes. At the same time, each of the other military services made a similar commitment. So in the Army, through our Net Zero Initiative and our Energy Initiatives Task Force, we are seeking ways to reduce the Army's total installation energy consumption and generate renewable energy. And net zero, as was mentioned in the video and by Mr. Kidd, is an integrated approach for installations to consume only as much energy or water as they can produce and to eliminate solid waste. Not only is that a mission that we are pursuing on our permanent installations, but we are also taking that concept into theater with the Net Zero to the Edge program that you'll be hearing a little more about this morning. The Energy Initiatives Task Force, or EITF, is employing an enter enterprise-wide approach to initiate and execute large-scale renewable energy systems. Currently, our installations on their own are pursuing small scale, which is generally less than four megawatts. But the Energy Initiatives Task Force is focused on large scale, 10 megawatts and up. Our goal is to furnish the Army with 2.5 million megawatt hours of renewable energy a year. And in 2025, that's anticipated to be 25% of the Army's total need. We are seeking innovative and collaborative partnerships with private industry and business to 
finance, plan, and execute a cost-effective portfolio. We estimated a couple of years ago that this would take about $7 billion of investment in the private sector. Currently, our projections are showing that it might take much less than that as the cost for renewable energy is coming down. The cost for wind power is coming down. The cost of solar panels is coming down. So the cost to deploy one gigawatt of renewable energy could be significantly less than that amount. This morning, you are going to hear from these Army leaders here on how they are enhancing mission effectiveness to become more ready and resilient through energy and power advancements. We'll start with Lieutenant General Mike Ferreter. He's one of my battle buddies, the Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management and Commanding General of U.S. Army Installation Management Command. And he's going to be talking about the Army's efforts to improve energy security and sustainability of our installations. He will be followed by my other battle buddy, Lieutenant General Ray Mason, who is the uh, Army G4, and he's going to be focusing on operational energy and culture change. Major General Mike Tucker, deputy for the Army G357, will be following Ray and discussing the G3's efforts on energy and some of his personal experiences as an energy end user in combat operations. And then, saving the best for last, Sergeant Major John Troxell is the I Corps Command Sergeant Major at Joint Base Lewis McCord, and he will be representing the mission impact of energy alternatives from a soldier's perspective. And so, with that, please join me in welcoming Lieutenant General Ferreter. Everybody, and uh, it's a it's a real honor to be on the panel this morning with uh, Command Sergeant Major Troxell, Major General Mike Tucker, and Ray Mason, and Miss Hammock. And thank you for for those remarks and and the welcome. And thanks to everybody for joining us today on this really important uh, issue. So for years, you know, we've assumed that there's always going to be an abundant supply of energy to power our installations. And uh, I've been in the Installation Management Command, Commanding General in the AXM here for just about a year now and, and had the opportunity to travel to many of our installations. And in the past, we routinely, routinely paid whatever cost for whatever energy we could use. The economic realities and the acute awareness of our vulnerability to fragile energy grids has caused us to reassess the link between energy, mission requirements, and our cost of doing business. Let me tell you about the principles that we're going to adopt. We have adopted underneath uh, the guidance of Ms. Hammock. So we now embrace the system of a, a system-wide approach of managing our energy program. And we're driving efficiency across the enterprise. And you see, when you have 74 installations and a total of 156 with the depots and, and our, our government-owned and contracted uh, facilities, when you take a big decision across an enterprise such as that, then you can uh, make big savings and make big change. Our focus on energy security is all about implementing an energy culture in all that we do. And so thank you for turning off those lights because <laughs> that's the first part of the culture. They weren't needed and I'm driving on. The key is, in, is really in executing our net zero strategy to ensure that our installations efficiently manage our energy and our water resources and reduce that solid waste stream that we heard those two great soldiers talking about. Now we do have challenges and we're going to work through these challenges. Everything we do drives energy use and higher utility bills and higher costs will limit our flexibility across the total army. We have to change energy on demand and start using smart business processes. We must be more efficient. Energy is an issue for today's leaders, not to be put off to the future. Now, we have some, sec some successes that we've already recorded, 
and leaders will start the effort as we go forward. We put energy into the Army campaign plan, and Ms. Hammock and I are able to use the influence and the teamwork that we find in what's called the Service Infrastructure Core Enterprise Board. It, within the Pentagon, we call it the SICE Board, and that brings all partners to the table across the Army to drive energy programs, not just across installation community, but across the Army. Let's, we'll go to the next slide, please. Utility services. The Army's utility bill is about $1.4 billion, and that is big business. And this bill squeezes critical soldier and family services. And though we reduce total consumption in spite of our op tempo and growth, we have to do more. You know, in other words, um, as the soldier growth was 20%, we actually reduce our energy by 13%. We placed great emphasis on obtaining essential funding for our energy program, and we tripled our program for energy modernization from 120 million in FY12 to 350 million in FY13. We also aggressively go after alternative financing. We have the largest third-party financing energy savings performance contract authority program in the federal government. In August, the Corps of Engineers issued a multiple award task order request for proposal for new large-scale renewable energy opportunities. And the goal, as we've heard today, is to develop one gigawatt of renewable energy by 2025. Also, right at home, we can, we can make change and affect change. And the Army's committed to reducing petroleum use by right-sizing our non-tactical vehicle fleet, utilizing electric and hybrid technologies, and exploring the emerging alternative fuels. Okay, next slide. Okay. You're paying that you're paying that bill, aren't you, Mike? I got it. <laughs> <laughs> if you could just uh, push about two dollars each to the center <laughs> aisle. That's right. Uh, we'll pay for this. On that. Yeah, we'll pay for this entire <laughs> session. Let's talk a little bit about net zero at our installations. Thanks, Ray. You got it, brother. Roger. <laughs> Now, we'll manage our energy and water resources with a net zero approach, and as you heard, producing as much energy as we use and capturing or reusing water and eliminating the generation of solid waste. Net zero uses a holistic management approach and addresses sustainable practices. And it's really as much about changing the culture and the belief that we can do it as it is as in actually implementing. And 17 pilot installations are shown here and they are the spearhead of this new management approach. You'll find a net zero trifold brochures like uh, around the room, and I ask you to take those with you. And then finally, our way ahead. The key to success is really to change the Army's culture so that the energy becomes an integral part of Army and personnel decision making. For the first time, we've incorporated energy goals and metrics into the Army campaign. This is a capstone document that sets priorities and really for the first time, uh, or as good as it's been, um, that you see uh, the entire Army staff focused at uh, sitting at the table together and focusing through the campaign plan on energy. And we're using multiple funding programs to develop re renewable and alternative energy, and our Energy Initiative Task Force is pursuing those large full-spectrum renewable projects. We're using new energy and water technologies around the Army already, and some of those include the application of microgrids at Fort Carson and Fort Bliss and rotating solar disks at Thule Army Depot that allows the solar panels to follow the movement of the sun and a new vehicle uh, to grid system that can pull power from electric vehicles to reduce installation peak load. Now, success of the program is not based on one activity or one funding program or even a single directive. It's the complex integration of it, all that we do. And really with that, I thank you for, uh, for taking a moment to listen to those remarks, and I'll pass to my good buddy, Ray Mason. All right. Well, thanks, Mike. And uh, good morning, and it is a real honor to be here, and I want to thank you all for taking some time to, to spend some, some quality time here talking about operational energy on my perspective and, and certainly all the other installation piece. And where Mike and his team, his magnificent team under the leadership of Ms. Hammock, looks at the installation side, our home stations, 
uh, where we, our deployment platforms and the energy that, that gets consumed there and trying to drive that down, uh, that's a key piece of it. But the other side of the equation is what happens when we deploy downrange. And while the, the goal is the same, we're trying to uh, use our energy smart, uh, there's some different uh, applications and different solution sets from what we do on installations and what we do uh, in a uh, battle space. But there are lots of similarities too. So we're partnered very well on this. And another piece of that is train as we fight. So at our training uh, bases, it's important that we begin uh, putting in place the kinds of capabilities and skill sets and culture, which is a big part of today, at the training bases, at the national training centers, uh, JRTC, CMTC, and even at home station training back at the hoods and the brags and the drums. And so this partnership between installation and operational energy is, is absolutely a marriage that uh, we've got to have, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good team, team effort. I'm going to kind of start off with two analogies uh, that I, I think, I hope you can relate to. One is a very tactical kind of analogy, and one is perhaps a more strategic view of where we're going with operational energy. It's not about using less fuel necessarily, although that's not a bad outcome and we're happy to get that. What it's about is using our fuel and our energy resources smarter. It's, you know, the power is in your hands and that really gets to the culture piece. So let me use an analogy that I stole from my operational energy office chief, Paul Rogie, a, a good engineer. And what he uses the analogy, and I'm plagiarizing it here, but heck, it got me through college, so I'll use it now too, um, <laughs> is it's, it's, it's going to the range and firing your weapon. Now, we, we take soldiers and we zero their weapon, and then we take them on the range and we qualify them, and we teach them certain skills with their weapon and ammunition. We teach them to fire, you know, aim, pick your target, hit your target, a three-round burst, use your ammunition wisely. We're not going to say, hey, we're going to be stingy with ammunition. That's not the issue. You know, we want to give you enough ammunition to close with and kill bad guys, but we want you to use your ammunition smartly. And so we put all those skill sets. That is a similar analogy to what we're trying to do with fuel. We want you to use that fuel that we're giving to you on the battlefield wisely and smart because it takes a lot of effort and a lot of friction and a lot of risk to get that fuel to your point of consumption. And then when you've got it, that's a big target for the enemy. So it's really a, a, a tactical piece to it, and I think that analogy is perhaps helpful. And then there's a strategic piece I want to look at, and it really deals with, and we talked about this in a panel that I sat with, with Ms. Burke here not too long ago with a, a bunch of folks from the energy industry and some of the uh, capital, you know, venture capitalists. And we talked about the, you know, strategic world of fuel and where we're going in the United States and pretty encouraging discussion actually in getting to, to energy independence. And I was very encouraged by the discussion there. But we did talk about anti-access and area denial. And if you look at what happened to us in Afghanistan over the past year with the closure of the PAC, uh, ground lines of communication, the PAC G-Lock. That, to me, is a harbinger of things to come. I think the next battle we fight, uh, the enemy is going to do everything they can to do anti-access and area denial for us because they're not going to want to give us six months to build up our supplies. You know, like we had in Desert Storm, we had in OIF-1, a little more challenging in Afghanistan, but having a base where you can build up six months, all those stores, and then launch operations out of there in a, in a fairly sanctuary kind of environment, uh, I would suspect that anybody we would face in the future would try to deny us of that, and that's where our fuel comes from. And so that puts us at a, a real risk in the future for our fuel supplies. They're going to try to hit that, under that soft underbelly and try to hit that Achilles heel we got. So as much as we can to try to reduce that, that risk and the soldiers that are on those lines of communication protecting that fuel, trying to reduce you know, that risk to those soldiers. So that's really what it's about. There's some science to it for sure. There's science and technology, there's partnerships with our great industry uh, partners, and we want to continue to explore that and leverage that as best we can, and we're getting some magnificent work from our commercial partners. And then there's the art to it, and in the art really deals more in the culture piece, and it kind of goes like turning the lights out. You know, remember back in the 70s when we were all in the big fuel lines, it was trying to reduce that amount of consumption of energy so you could save dollars and, and make yourself more effective and efficient. And it, and it is about this balance. It, it's about this sweet spot between effectiveness and efficiency. Yes, efficiency is important, and we clearly understand where we are economically and trying to reduce down those dollars and be good stewards of the, the, the tax dollars that our great citizens give to us. But it really is about effectiveness. Ultimately, it's about winning the battle and closing with and destroying the enemy. 
So it's, it's that balance between science and art. Um, and this is a great panel, and uh, I won't exactly say it takes a village to do operational energy, but I would say that it takes a team of teams. And you see the team that's up here and, and many of the folks that are, uh, that are out here in the audience. Um, Paul Rogie, who runs our operational energy office, has a magnificent team. Uh, Dr. Rick, Rick, Vic Ramdis, who runs my logistics innovation agency, is really our energy, it's really our, our brain trust uh, for pushing the envelope, grabbing commercial off the shelf kind of technology and pulling it in to the left. So if, if you're a commercial partner and you want to go talk to somebody about where we're going and opportunities there, Dr. Vic Ramdis, Colonel Paul Rogie are really your, your entrance pieces there. Uh, I also want to recognize my Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major Chance, who's a great battle buddy of mine, and he's going to have a panel later on today uh, with our reserve component teammates, and we're going to talk a little bit more about operational energy again at the tactical level. Uh, just this past month, uh, our Chief of Staff, General Odierno, uh, signed me as the G4 of the Army and my team as the R staff lead officially uh, for operational energy. We've been doing it for well over a year, but you know he officially uh, designated that. What does that mean? One of the things we're overseeing is about a $3 billion investment in, uh, in operational energy uh, and $800 million within the Army. So it's a significant, large program, and uh, I take it very seriously, but I'm very optimistic about it. So um, I'd ask you to go to the next slide, please. This is, uh, yeah, this is, go back one, please. There you go. This is our energy campaign plan uh, just signed, and I, I gave each one of you guys uh, one of these, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But you can see that the Sergeant Major of the Army Chandler, the Chief of Staff, and our Secretary all signed uh, this particular document, and it demonstrates our senior Army leadership's commitment to operational energy and trying to do the things that I talked about earlier. This is really part of the culture piece, and if, if you can get the culture to change, you can really make dramatic changes in what, what happens downrange. So uh, we're very excited about this, and uh, we really appreciate the leadership coming on board. And again, it's, it's, it's all about how can you use energy smarter. So with this pamphlet, I probably wouldn't need to say another word. It kind of lays it out very well in here. We gave you two copies. So what does that mean? One's for you to use, and one's for you to be a disciple of operational energy. Go forth from this meeting, go out there, and preach operational energy. Hand it to one of your buddies and talk about it. So uh, I'd ask you to take some time and look through this. And, and the rest of the, the pitch I'm going to give here kind of is really dovetailing with this particular brochure. Uh, next slide. Some numbers and some, some things to ponder in here. In World War II, we had 20 times as many soldiers on the battlefield, and uh, we used a lot less fuel, about two gallons per day per soldier. That has totally reversed itself. We have 20 times less soldiers on the battlefield. We're much more effective and efficient, but we use 20 times as much fuel. Now, it isn't exactly a math problem like that, because you think about what an M1 tank can do and what a tank in World War II could do or what a soldier brought to the battle space, each individual soldier in World War II, and what they bring to the battle space now. We are much more effective than we were there. But nevertheless, that glide slope is like this for fuel consumption, and we've got to drive that down. So learning from the past, figuring out how we can do it in the future is, is really a big part of this piece. Um, the, the story I use is if you're a, and m many of the folks that work for me have heard this a gazillion times, so just take a quick nap, but, but for those that haven't, th this is kind of my story and the way I look at it. If you're a forward operating base commander in Afghanistan and every day 20 trucks show up, fuel trucks show up outside of your FOB, those fuel trucks had to get from wherever their point of sale was to that FOB. You had to protect it along the way. We put soldiers at risk out there conducting convoy security. Once it gets to your front gate, those 20 trucks, each one of them could be a bomb to get inside your gate, so you got that friction at the, at the gate of the FOB, and then you've, you've got to store that fuel on your FOB somewhere. That makes to, you to build a bigger FOB and big target for the enemy. So what can we do to help reduce all that chain in there? If we can reduce you down even by five trucks, we've reduced you by 20% in your risk that your soldier experiencing every day. Now what's interesting is the vast majority of that fuel in Afghanistan is being consumed by what? most of you people know, by generators. It's consuming and producing electricity to run uh, office spaces, battle set sy systems, uh, living spaces, and then there's a quality of life issue here that we're trying to get our arms wrapped around as well. Once you decide that you're going to bring in uh, 
Dining facilities are going to serve Class A's, three hot meals a day. You're going to bring in gymnasiums. You're going to bring in the PX. You're going to bring in all these capabilities for a quality of life for our soldiers, sailors, and airmen, Marines. There's a cost involved in that. I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do. You want your soldiers and you want your troops to have the best they can have. One of the challenges is what's good enough. How much can you afford? And what do you what? And, and, and what I'm doing is working with the Army Science Board and some other folks to try to build an algorithm that says, okay, if you want this quality of life, this is the kind of cost in terms of lines of communication, the amount of trucks it's going to take to get in there. And then the commander can make a wise decision as to what quality of life he or she wants to have for their troops. So that's a big part of what we're working. Uh, next slide. Okay, four major areas that we're focused on. You saw it in the video, and Ms. Hammock has laid that out. First, we're focused on soldiers. And if you were at the congressional breakfast this morning, you, t you heard the chief talk about uh, we're focused on the squad level. It's the one area we're not as overmatched as we should be. We, wanna, we don't want to just barely win at the squad level. level. We want to have a slam dunk. And we've got to really provide our individual soldiers with better capability, and we're doing that. Batteries are a challenge. We're giving them you know, uh, solar blankets, rechargeable batteries, a way to recharge that. So we're focused on the soldiers. Again, you can see it in here. Secondly, I talked about basing. So I don't really need to go a lot more in there, but I'll tell you this. We're, we have two experimental uh, systems we're using. One of them is called the Base Camp Integration Laboratory at Fort Devens, and the other one is Smart and Green Energy. What we're doing there is we're testing out commercial off-the-shelf capabilities to prove that it can save energy, and then the big piece we're doing is we're writing that into our contracts, and we know it can be done. And so we can write specifications, and then the contractors can meet that, and it's a reasonable partnership between government and private industry. So that's what we're doing on the basing side. Next slide. Vehicles, and that's really the high-end piece of it. And the way I'd look at that is you can pay me now or you can pay me later. Yes, to put a lot of energy efficiency into a vehicle is very expensive, and it costs money up front and, and, and causes the unit price of each vehicle or each system we buy to be higher. But in the long run, in the long tail, it saves you money. Less fuel, less fuel trucks, less maintenance units fixing fuel trucks, and you can just see the second, third, and fourth order effects. Part of our challenge is, is partnering with the ASALT community to describe that sustainment cost over the tail, over the life cycle of the system. And so pay me now or pay me later. Aircraft, very excited. We're doing some things with the improved in engine there to get you a faster, can go higher, less energy consuming helicopter, the ITEP engine. And then last slide, energy informed culture. I think uh, Sergeant Major of the Army may be coming in a little bit later to talk about that, but it is going to have to be done at the non-commissioned officer level. That's why my Sergeant Major and I are working on that, and it's the backbone of our Army that's going to talk to our junior soldiers and, and show them why this is so important. I mean, it's one thing for a three-star general to stand up and talk about it, but when they're, not, when they're a platoon sergeant, when they're when their sergeant major talks about it, they're going to stand up and listen because that's who really they're interested in. And so that's why that culture piece is so important. I look forward to your questions, and I'll be followed by my battle buddy, Mike Tucker. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I wanted to give you an appreciation for uh, energy consumption or, or a tactical appreciation for energy consumption. And, you know, we're, I think we're all, our soldiers are all products of the society from which they came, and we come from the land of plenty. And so they expect, they expect plenty everywhere they go. And uh, they have an insatiable appetite for limited resources, as uh, one great general used to say. And, and that's obviously a, uh, that's a problem set we have to deal with in terms of, of what uh, General Mason said about changing the culture. Uh, it, it's interesting, as, as I reflect on my personal experiences, uh, uh, operations officer in an M1 tank battalion in Desert Storm, which is like, I just, it's like 21 years ago. I can't believe it. It's 21 years ago, but but that was a different battle, and we were traipsing across the desert at a blistering speed. Uh, we weren't too concerned about energy because we weren't really stopping anywhere long enough to plug anything in. In fact, uh, there was one generator uh, in the battalion talk, and and we used it to charge our electric razors with. Uh, and it's it's so strange at how we come today. The energy demands on a formation when we start going into FOBs, forward operating bases, and we become static, our demands just go through the roof. Now, needless to say, we we've, we've have a, uh, a huge uh, leap ahead in technology in terms of situation awareness tools uh, that allow us to see ourselves, see the enemy, see the environment, much more uh, clarity with fidelity than we ever did before. Uh, 
there's a uh, there's an initiative right now uh, called Net Zero Energy Energy to the Edge, which is uh, being championed both by uh, uh, Miss Hammock and her fo good folks, the G4, and the Rapid Equipping Fielding Team uh, REF out of the G3, and uh, it's taking place right now. Over there's 19 FOBs in Afghanistan where we have this uh, Net Zero to the Edge initiative taking place. And just to give you a, a, a quick soundbite. Uh, you know, it's it's a combination of of not just fuel uh, efficiencies in terms of generators, but its use of solar uh, energy, uh, its use of managing gray water, uh, and and burning burning trash and burning waste as well. Uh, one FOB, for example, near FOB Sharana uh, in RC South, FOB Xerox, uh, 200 by 220 people on this FOB. It's an it's a it's an isolated FOB. It only gets refueled by air, uh, refueled re resupplied by air about once a week. Uh, consumes 800 gallons of fuel a day. Uh, 600 of that are for generators. And so we brought in the team to come in. And, and what's interesting about uh, this net zero to the edge is it incorporated this individual called the operational energy advisor. I just can't believe that. Uh, I mean, put that in an infantry squad. Build an MOS. I don't know what you call it. But this person has become key and essential personnel. I, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Because we, we the, the, the tactical operating force, are of the, of the mindset that, that more is better uh, and, uh, and bigger is better. And so when you're going out to buy generators and they give you these little plastic credit cards and you go out on a local economy and start buying generators, you just buy as many as you can before they stop, stop having any more. And then you go buy extension cords, and we don't buy big ones. We buy as many extension cords as we can of all flavors, like the kind you plug your Christmas tree lights into. And we're going to run 240 amp power through this thing. And, and you can imagine the safety problems that we had. Uh, we didn't have distribution boxes, so everybody had to have their own generator. And it really didn't matter about <coughs> the, the, the kind of generator you had depending on how, how much rank you had. So the more rank you had, the bigger generator. It had nothing to do with what your energy needs or requirements were. And it was absolutely, it was mayhem. It was, it was disaster on a grand scale. And so now we have this, this operational energy advisor uh, at the brigade combat team. And this person helps us manage energy. I mean, go think about that for a minute. And we've heard some of the great stuff about it. But we didn't know how to manage it. We didn't know how to regulate generators and, and understand what the load is on a generator. I'd have a generator running at 40% load and I'm thinking, oh my God, we better get another generator. Because I'm a tanker and if I get below 50% fuel, I got to get refueled right away because no telling what I'm going to have to do, you know, two hours from now. So we go buy more generators and bigger ones. And, and so this, uh, this operational energy advisor helped us get distribution properly, have properly load our generators uh, distribute them so that they're where they need to be, where the energy requirements are, and we saw savings uh, overnight almost. And people stopped getting electrocuted in the shower, which is really important. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you know, we were able to pump water where we needed to pump water as opposed to carry water. And just this one fob I told you about that had an 800 gallon a day requirement. Uh, in two weeks, they were they had reduced that by about 280 gallons, just just like that, just through some real quick fixes. And so we're pushing that across the, uh, the theater right now. And, if, and I also think about some personal experiences where I had to pull tanks off the line to, to escort Hemet, fuel or Hemets uh, to get fuel. Now that's using combat power that I needed to fight the enemy, but I couldn't. I had to use combat power to escort these logistic patrols, which has been spoken about already. But, you know, the government didn't necessarily give us all that combat power to, to be a self-licking ice cream cone. You know, we got that combat power to, to go, go take the fight to the enemy. And so when you're having to scavenge combat power uh, to go back and, and keep your logistics tail running, you got to ask yourself, why do I need so many logistics? Is there any, can I be a little smarter up here in my use of this energy uh, so I don't need to bleed that combat power off of the, uh, off the front line? And, and finally, uh, as we become a more expeditionary army, uh, we've got to get smarter at our use of energy at the point of need, at the edge. And so we've got these, uh, these energy efficient fobs, these, uh, 
that we've incorporated at our combat at our dirt combat training centers which are very important because if we're going to change this culture we can't let you come out to the to the national trauma I mean national training center and uh, some of you have been there know what I mean. It's kind of a national trauma center. If you've been, <laughs> Can't you be. had your backside raked up and down the central corridor by the op corps. But, but nonetheless, you've got to make soldiers and commanders understand that they don't have a big, giant, you know, 10-inch diameter power cable following them everywhere they go, that they've got to train as they fight. And so we've incorporated that into the observer controller and in, into the better construct of the, of the DIRT CTC so they operate under the constraints uh, and power management through their operational energy advisor, so they learn that in training. So when they go expeditionary to a, a place far, far away, they've already been trained on how to operate under those constraints. Sergeant Major. Hello. Good morning, uh, Assistant Secretary Hammock, to the general officers on the panel, and to everyone here. It's truly an honor for me to be here today. As mentioned earlier, I am the uh, U.S. Army First Corps Command Sergeant Major at Joint Base Lewis McCord. Just recently, I returned from Afghanistan, where my headquarters served as the ISAF Joint Command, the operational headquarters for the whole theater. And as the command sergeant major for that organization, uh, I was able to get around to the whole country and see all of our soldiers and all of our uh, coalition partners in action. And I got to see a lot of the things that we were doing, some of the things that General Tucker talked about on uh, power and energy. And what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, one, for future as we look at the Army and the Joint Force for 2020, how we need to equip our soldiers so that we're managing power effectively, but we're not degrading capability. The other thing I'm going to talk about is how do we gain power and energy efficiencies in a resource-constrained environment that we're uh, going into here. Uh, and then how do we change that culture that some of my fellow panel members have already talked about and make our soldiers into good stewards of power and energy and to be power managers. Next slide, please. First thing I want to show you is this slide here on uh, energy and the operational hierarchy. And I, I'd like to focus on the operational and tactical level. Ms. Hammock already talked about bullet two under the operational uh, area there. About uh, 70 to 80 percent of our resupply volume is fuel and water. And a logistical approach to energy during combat operations will constrain our operational options. This has to be an operational approach where commanders at all levels, as they plan operations, are thinking about power and energy and how to be good stewards and power managers. Down in the tactical uh, area, we've talked about batteries, and I just want to uh, illuminate there the dismounted uh, maneuver challenges that we have. Uh, General Tucker talked about Cop Zarak in, uh, over in Paktika province, which is covered by mountains, and uh, those soldiers that go out and patrol there every day they are loaded down if they go out on a three-day operation with more than 400 pounds of batteries. Um, and we have to look at uh, efficient ways of uh, reducing that weight. The other thing I'd like to talk about, which is a huge operational concern in Afghanistan right now, the number one uh, threat, as we know, is the improvised explosive device. But more specifically, the number one killer of our soldiers is the dismounted, the uh, pressure plate improvised explosive device that is non-metallic that is found all over southern Afghanistan. I will tell you, if you make a trip to Walter Reed in Bethesda and you go into the physical therapy clinic there and you look, there's about 111 patients in there now and 90% of them are trying to learn how to walk with their limbs again because of wounds they sustained in southern Afghanistan by this dismounted counter IED threat. Now, as we look forward to future operations, uh, we've got to look at this dismounted counter IED th threat uh, very seriously because of how cheap it is to build it. But if you look at the equipment that we give our soldiers to defeat the device, not just to attack the network, they have about six different types of handheld devices to defeat the device. All six of them do uh, different things. Some uh, are metal detectors, some have ground penetrating radar, some have both. But all six of them have different batteries that come with them. So when you look at that 400 pounds of equipment that potentially a platoon could go out for three days, tack on the, the weight of the batteries for the handheld counter IED devices that we have to use. And when you talk about these uh, handheld devices, it's just not the engineer that's using them in Afghanistan. The infantry soldier, the cavalryman, the non-standard artilleryman are all using this equipment because it's the number one threat and it's how the enemy is using this faceless uh, weapon to disrupt what we're trying to do in southern Afghanistan. 
So we've got to look at that and how do we come together and get one device that does all the things we need it to do to defeat this threat. And as I mentioned how cheap this weapon is, it costs less than a dollar to make this weapon. So even against near-peer threats in the future or whatever operations we may, do, we may be doing, there's going to be some kind of insurgent type activity or criminal patronage networks that are going to try and protect their investment. And how will they do that? It will be the, through the use of improvised explosives. So it's something we have to continue to look for, uh, towards as we go forward. Next slide. I want to talk a little bit about soldier power and, and the future. And as we look at the soldier load for the future, and we've already talked about the weight of the soldier, regardless of he's uh, humping mountains in uh, a place like eastern Afghanistan or on rough and uneven terrain with that uh, over 100 pounds of kit on, we've got to look at ways uh, to reduce that load so that that terrain alone isn't beating up our soldiers uh, prior to they even get to the objective and engage the enemy. We also have to make sure that uh, the system allows for soldiers to have effective communications. Uh, we have to look at the soldier as a system, and we have to understand we have op operational requirements for that soldier as a system. And we also have to make sure that this equipment allows our soldiers to see first, to be able to act first against the enemy, and finish decisively. And then, of course, uh, in this digital environment, we have to make so sure our soldiers are in the lower tactical Internet and it, the equipment they have must be wireless capable. So we've already talked about the swipe system, the soldier-worn integrated uh, protective equipment, and how it allows uh, soldiers to be able to recharge batteries on the move. And it also allows them to go to different uh, things like solar blankets or uh, vehicles to charge their batteries. Or they could use half-charge batteries to allow them to charge this system. We have to continue to look at systems like this to equip our soldiers so that they're prepared for the threats of the future. Next slide. You know, the GSPL does a lot of testing on vehicle equipment and capabilities, and we have to continue to do that testing and continue to find efficient ways uh, on how we do mounted operations. But now we have to promote good stewardship within our ranks. I will tell you, when you go onto a patrol in Afghanistan, I went on a patrol with the unit one day, and we went out for two hours, and they changed their batteries. Uh, for this two-hour operation. The next day we got ready to go on another operation. The first thing they did was change all of their batteries. So it talked about, uh, General Mason talked about it earlier, with that kind of waste on batteries alone, think of the resupply that comes with the batteries, the convoys that have to bring those batteries along uh, roads that have IEDs on them, and uh, we've got to find ways to be better stewards at that. The other thing, being an old cavalryman like General Tucker, back when I was a platoon sergeant, uh, back in the 90s, I used to have to know what my cruising range on my vehicle was during operations in uh, the NTC that we talked about or in the JMRC uh, in, in Europe because it may be three days before I get supplied on fuel. So I had to know how much fuel I consumed that day and how much fuel I had left to make sure I didn't run out of fuel. Another thing that uh, I would have to do is if I'm on a screen line uh, trying to kill the enemy reconnaissance from my commander and give him the read of the battle, at some times, based on the, the fuel I have and the power I have available, I would have to go totally cold on my systems and depend on my soldiers being forward in observation posts to be able to accomplish that mission from my commander. Nowadays, what happens, a unit goes out on a mission, regardless of how far they go, they come back, the first thing they do is refuel. And uh, General Mason already talked about the fuel line, and uh, so it goes along with uh, the batteries there that the less fuel we use, the more we save and also the less fuel convoys are coming on those routes uh, that potentially could become enemy threats or potentially could become enemy weapons as uh, vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices. And uh, the last thing I'll talk about on here is as we go towards this re resource-constrained environment where we won't have the ability to do live fire type training or shooting, we, c we have to continue to leverage the virtual constructive and gaming stuff that we have in our Army. At Joint Base lewis McCord, we have a Mission Command Training Center where we have uh, a lot of stuff that soldiers and units can do uh, live. We can also uh, replicate that in a virtual or constructive environment that allows them to continue to build on things like developing standard operating procedures and uh, working uh, battle communications and stuff like that. But we're not taking our vehicles out of the motor pool. We're not shooting weapons or anything like that. We will never be able to uh, replicate what happens in live, but as we move forward, we have to continue to leverage this stuff 
so that we can continue to have effective training, but we're saving on power and energy. Next slide, please. Two events I wanted to talk about that I was involved with where we were in an environment that constrained what we were trying to do. First of all, in 2004, uh, as the insurgency was kicking off in Iraq, uh, Route Tampa all the way from uh, Navistar in Kuwait all the way up to the Turkish border was under intense fire. And I was in uh, Mosul at the time in northern Iraq, and uh, with all those convoys being hit, it started to constrain the, the supplies that we were getting up north. So all of a sudden we had to institute and become managers not only of our power and, uh, and our fuel and our water, but also of our, of our food because of the nature of what was happening down south. When we initially did that, you know, there was a, a slight paranoia amongst small unit leaders there because now they had to be managers of all of this stuff. It was something foreign to them. And as was mentioned earlier by my panel members, in some cases we have this sense of entitlement because we ask for something and it shows up. And the other thing, and we talked about the G-lock closures in Afghanistan, I will tell you that it was something that we looked at every day from November of last year until I redeployed this summer on what days of supply we had when it came to fuel, food, water, and ammunition. And again, when we go back to building power managers in our organizations, the less batteries we use, the more efficient we are with fuel, the days of supply would go up and then the uh, impact of the Wee Shaman and the Torkham border crossings uh, being closed were less of an impact. But I agree with General Mason when we talk about A2AD in the future, it's something that we're going to have to continue to deal with, and it's something that, uh, for another reason that we have to build uh, this power manager capability at the small unit level. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about was a good news story of soldiers in Afghanistan on being good stewards of power and energy. In Bad Geese province in RC West on uh, the Iranian border was a small combat outpost called Cop Reaper. And there was an artillery battery that had a platoon there that was conducting uh, counter uh, border op operations, uh, making sure that weapons and drugs and other things weren't coming across the border. But as they got out there and as they were isolated from the lines of communication, they started uh, getting their water out of a stream to bathe and to shave and, and do things like that. So they saved their bottled water for just drinking and consumption. They also, at night, would turn their generators off and they would establish these observation posts like I talked about earlier outside of the combat, uh, the combat outposts so they could conserve energy. Because again, they had to be good stewards of it because they didn't know when they were going to get resupplied again. And then as the winter came in and the mountain passes started to close, they even had to think of this a lot better. So as I talked to the platoon leader and platoon sergeant on the ground out there, the first thing they were talking to me about is how they were conserving power and energy to make sure that they still had the capability to accomplish uh, the commander's vision and intent on the battlefield out there. Next slide, please. This is my last slide. In, uh, it's a couple of statements that uh, are from General John Allen, the current commander of uh, U.S. Forces Afghanistan and, and the International Security Assistance Force, and then General Mattis the higher headquarters at CENTCOM, and then, of course, by our chairman, uh, General Dempsey, and then the SMA, Ray Chandler. And I want to call your attention to the second bullet under General Allen there. Uh, General Allen, at the highest level, was talking to us, the subordinate commands, about uh, improving combat effectiveness through better, being better managers of power and energy. And then the second bullet uh, from General Mattis as well when he talks about synchronized sy systems that meet the demands um, and that are sustainable and durable and maintainable. And uh, that's my last uh, comment, and I uh, look forward to any questions you may have in the, uh, in the question and answer session. Thank you very much.